Hey guys, so we learnt a lot of things about cathode rays. We saw that even though it was proved that cathode ray particles were some form of charged particles, scientists were not ready to give away the atomic worldview and claim that these particles were indeed subatomic particles. But how could someone really prove that? Well, there was one person who could see beyond the atomic worldview and that was none other than J.J. Thompson. When J.J. Thompson heard about this mysterious cathode rays, he started to investigate their properties using his modified cathode ray tube. Let's see what were the modifications he did. He made a hole in the anode and extended the glass tube as shown here. To see the cathode rays clearly, he coated the glass behind the anode with zinc sulfide. The unique property of zinc sulfide is, it glows when a charged particle falls on it. So now, let's take a look at his famous experiment. When he turned on the power, he saw a glowing spot at point B. Now, can you guess why did he see the glowing spot at point B? Well, you might remember that cathode rays travel from cathode to anode in a straight line. And since there's a hole in the anode, they will keep traveling in straight line and hit at point B. So clearly, the glow on the zinc sulfide layer tells us that these are charged particles. But there's nothing new in that. We already know that. We need to know whether these particles are positively charged particles or negatively charged particles. What would you do? Well, Thompson had a genius idea. He used a simple principle that like charges repel each other and unlike charges attract each other. Let's see how he used this simple idea to find out the nature of these charged particles. He added a set of two plates which were placed perpendicular to the path of cathode rays. He connected one plate to the positive terminal of the battery and the other plate to the negative terminal of the battery. As you might have guessed, the plate connected to the positive terminal of the battery gets positively charged and similarly, the other plate gets negatively charged. So let's find out what happened when Thomson passed these cathode rays through these charge plates. He saw that the glowing spot shifted from B to A. That means that these particles were attracted to the positive plate. Hmm, interesting, right? So now can you guess what is the charge of the particle? Yes, you are right. Since these particles were attracted toward the positive plate, they must be negatively charged particles. And these negatively charged particles are what we call as electrons. Apart from this, Thompson also noticed that when he increased the potential difference between these two charged plates, the deflection also increased. Now, can you think why is that happening? By increasing the potential difference, the electrical force on these particles also increases. And that's why the deflection was also increasing. Therefore, we can say that the deflection of these particles is proportional to the potential difference between these plates. Now, if you remember, we saw that the cathode rays get deflected by a magnet and by reversing the magnet, the deflection also reversed. Let's see how Thomson studied the effect of a magnet on these rays. When Thomson passed these cathode rays to the magnet, he saw that the glowing spot moved to point C. When he increased the strength of the magnet, he saw that the deflection also increased. Therefore, he concluded that the deflection of these particles is proportional to the magnetic strength. Okay, so clearly, we can say that the deflection of these particles is proportional to the magnetic strength and the potential difference between these two plates. So taking a quick recap, we saw the deflection at point A because of the electrical force. We saw deflection at point C because of the magnetic force. And when both the fields are off, the rays went totally undeflected straight to point B. So what can we do 
with this information? Well, Thomson had a eureka moment when he realized that even in the presence of the magnetic and the electrical force, he could balance the glowing spot at point B. Sounds confusing? Let's see how he did it. Since the magnetic force is pulling these particles downward and the electrical force is pulling these particles upward, by varying these two forces, he successfully brought the glowing spot at point B. At this point, the both the forces are exactly equal to each other. And we can write this in the form of an equation, as shown here, where the magnetic force is equal to the electrical force. So after solving this equation, Thomson found the charge to mass ratio of these particles, which was equal to 1.76 into 10 power 11 coulombs per kg, where Q is the charge of the particle in coulombs and M is the mass of the particle in kgs. Now many scientists already knew the charge to mass ratio of various atoms. They also knew that the smallest ion will have the highest charge to mass ratio and that was hydrogen ion. And the charge to mass ratio of hydrogen ion is 9.58 into 10 power 7 coulomb per kg. Now if we divide the charge to mass ratio of both the particles, we get something around 1800. This finding was highly significant because Thomson realized that these particles have mass 1800 times less than the lightest atom known, which means that these particles are way too tiny than an atom. Since it was known that the behavior of cathode ray particles was independent of the gas or the metal electrode inside the tube, the last piece of the puzzle needed was to prove that these cathode ray particles were even smaller than an atom. And that's what Thomson concluded from his experiment. Since these starched particles were way too smaller than an atom, they must be part of an atom. And that's how the first subatomic particle, the electron, was discovered. Wow, amazing, right? Could you have ever thought that by simply passing current through an empty glass tube between two metal electrodes would lead to the discovery of electron? Surely not. Even though several scientists had demonstrated many of the properties of cathode rays, it was only Thomson who insisted conclusively that electrons were building block of matter and a subatomic particle. And that's what won him the Nobel Prize. But Thomson did not only stop at that. He went ahead and predicted many more things. But we will save all of that for later. Until then, stay curious. So let's summarize all the things that we have learned today. Using a modified cathode ray tube, Thomson proved that deflection of cathode ray particles was proportional to the electrical field between two plates and the magnetic force by a magnet. Thomson balanced the electrical and the magnetic force in such a way the rays were totally undeflected. At this point, both the forces were exactly equal to each other. Thomson was able to determine the charge to mass ratio of these particles which was 1800 times more than hydrogen. By comparing the charge to mass ratio of electron and hydrogen, Thomson concluded that electrons are way too smaller than an atom. And that's why they must be a part of atom.